Good evening, everyone. Thank you to come to the new uh, software craftsmanship Romandy event in collaboration with the Java user group. So my name is Alexandre Kuva. And my name is Peti Koch from the Java and, group Switzerland. Yeah. And we have Robert C. Martin as Uncle Bob. How do you want we call you? Uncle Bob or Robert? Just Bob is fine. It, Bob is fine. OK, cool. Yeah. Go for this. Okay, let you pass the the slide. Okay, before Bob starts with his talk, uh, we have some uh, slides. Um, warm thank you to all the sponsors of Java User Group Switzerland for their ongoing support. Then you are now in a big marker webinar session. There's a chat which are you already using that's excellent for example please write where are you joining from this will be interesting for us if you have questions please use the q and a tab to post your question we will pick it up at the end or after the talk and uh, you have the option to vote uh, for the questions so we see which questions are uh, most interesting for you if you want to get in touch with the community from the Java User Group Switzerland, there is the Slack workspace where you see here the uh, URL um, and where you can contact uh, us, get in touch with us. And uh, so if you don't know, we have a community page for the software craftsmanship uh, Ramandish. So here it's the URL or it's faster. The, the QR code and next page. Then we will record this event and publish it on our YouTube channel. Um, you see here also the, the link, uh, youtube.chuck.ch. You can subscribe to YouTube channel. If you click the bell, then you will get a push notification as soon as this video is available. Same for the channel from the Software Crafts Romandy. And we will send after the event an, e an email to all the participants with a link to a feedback form. And uh, this time we will have a raffle for a free ticket to the WJOX conference in Munich in November. This is really a very nice conference with a lot of nice speakers. So if you uh, send back or fill out the feedback form, you will be part of the raffle and maybe you will have the opportunity to join this excellent conference. And if you want to join uh, our next events, just sign up for the mailing list of the Job User Group Switzerland and you will get an email with the upcoming events as soon as they are uh, known or join the Software Crafts Romandy meetup group and you will get all the information about the upcoming events. And today we have the pleasure to welcome everyone after the talk here in Big Mark on, on the wonder.jog.ch uh, platform where we can interact with each other in small circles and uh, talk to each other. You will Bob will also join us and uh, I'm really looking forward to meet you afterwards uh, online on wonder.chuck.ch. And so now, thank you everyone and take your seat and take your beer and pass a good moment, approximately one hour with Uncle Bob. Bob, your turn. My turn. All right, let's see. Um, so let's see, I'm now sharing my screen. You should see it. It should say the scribe's oath. I hope that's what you see on your screen. Yes. And this is a talk that I have given many, many times in many, many places. It's often called the future of programming. You see that that is the subtitle. So what we're going to talk about is the past of programming. We're going to be going to um, take a nice long history 
history of what software is, how it began, where it started. And we will walk through the decades until we get to the present time. And then we will use that trajectory to project forward and see where we might be going in the future. And with that, let's look back. I'm going to take you all the way back to, oh, all the way back to 1936, really. We're going to begin with Alan Turing. Alan Turing, who wrote a paper in 1936. Uh, I hope you've read this paper. And if you have not read this paper, I hope you will read it. And possibly the best way to read this paper is to get a copy of Charles Petzold's wonderful book entitled The Annotated Turing. In this book, Charles reproduces the entire paper by, by Alan Turing, but then surrounds it with lots of explanation and history and anecdotes. And it's just a wonderful read. I have, I have read that book two times. I'm going to read it a third time. It's just a wonderful, wonderful description of what Alan Turing was doing and how he did it and why he did it. Briefly, what happened is that Alan Turing was a mathematician who was attempting to resolve one of the great questions of a particular kind of equation, a Diophantine equation, an equation with nothing but integers in it. And the question he was attempting to answer was whether or not there was a formal mechanistic way to prove whether or not a particular Diophantine equation could or could not be solved. And I won't bore you with the details, except to say that in the end, he demonstrated that there is no formal mechanistic way to do this. There are Diophantine equations which may yield results, but there's no way to prove that they yield results. And he demonstrated this by inventing the modern digital computer. He invented it in his head. It was a mathematical abstraction. Uh, he went on to write programs in this computer in his head. Uh, yeah, it must have taken him a fair bit of work to, to debug them, <laughs> especially without a machine to run them on. But if you read his paper, what you will see in that paper is a tremendous amount of what you and I would recognize as code. It looks a little different, but it's clearly code. It's And he, he had to invent symbolic language. He had to invent finite state machines. He had to invent macros. He had to invent subroutine calls. He had to invent most of the things that you and I would consider necessary for any kind of computer language. And then he used it to resolve this mathematical question. Fascinating, fascinating reading, fascinating guy. Now, the kind of um, work that he eventually got involved into was the breaking of the Enigma codes for World War II. The Germans had this lovely little computer called a, an Enigma machine. It wasn't really a computer. It was a bunch of gears and, and switches and so on that scrambled letters. But it made it almost impossible to break the code unless you had a really powerful way to search through all the possibilities. And it was Alan Turing and his folks in England who who got together and figured out a way to search through all the possibilities and break the Enigma code. And many of the techniques that, that Alan Turing had created in his paper paid off in the creation of the machines that broke the Enigma code. The kind of devices that Alan Turing was using were these things here, these relays. If, if you look at that, you'll see how it works. It's pretty obvious. There's a a coil of wire that turns that uh, piece of metal into an electromagnet. There's another piece of metal that will get attracted to the electromagnet, and that piece of metal will move those little switches down there at the bottom. So if you send current through the coil, it will change the position of those switches. That's enough to build a computer. You can build any kind of computer out of a device like this. Unfortunately, of course, the devices are slow. They have a cycle time of perhaps 10 hertz, 10, 10 times a second. There was another possibility even in the late 1940s. They could have used vacuum tubes, 
But vacuum tubes were not reliable at that time. They weren't mass produced in any quantity. They had lots of reliability issues. They were very power hungry and they didn't last a long time. So any kind of machine built out of vacuum tubes in 1945 was probably going to fail. Although it was kind of obvious that this is where the technology had to go because the vacuum tubes were a million times faster, literally a million times faster than a relay was. And so by the end of the war and after the war, the vacuum tube technology continued to increase. And Alan Turing got involved with this particular machine, the ACE, the Automated Computing Engine. This was a fascinating machine. It had a 22-bit word. We didn't know about bytes back then. Alan Turing helped to invent the instruction set and, and uh, some of the electronics. And this machine actually did get built, and he actually did write software for it. But I want to walk through a little bit of the technology with you before we talk about that. The memory for the ACE machine was planned to be mercury delay lines. A mercury delay line is a tube. You can see these tubes on the image down there. It's a tube full of mercury metal. And you put a speaker on one side and a microphone on the other side, and you emit your bits through the speaker, and then you hear them with the microphone. And of course, they propagate through the mercury at the speed of sound through mercury. And then you electronically wrap them back around to the speaker. So it's a kind of rotating memory that would have been very fast. You could have gotten hundreds of thousands of, of uh, cycles per second out of this. And uh, a, a tube like that would store a thousand bits. So uh, his idea for a machine was a, a machine with 22 of those uh, mercury delay lines so that he could have a 22-bit memory, 22-bit wide memory, and perhaps a thousand words. The problem, however, was that these delay lines uh, were subject to outside vibration. So if a, a truck drove by on the road outside, it would vibrate the mercury and destroy the data in memory. And, and so in the end, they decided not to use the mercury delay lines. They decided instead to use cathode ray tube memory. Now, some of you out there know what a cathode ray tube is. Some of you have seen one. Old television sets were based on cathode ray tubes. Uh, if you remember turning off the TV and seeing the picture gradually shrink down into a little dot, <laughs> that was a cathode ray tube. Cathode ray tube uh, sprays an electron beam at the, at the screen, and there are phosphors on the inside of the screen that will light up if the electron beam hits them. And so you can paint a picture on the screen or... You can paint bits on the screen. And what's interesting about a cathode ray tube is that if you spray electrons at a particular spot on the screen, that spot on the screen will develop a charge. Now, that charge won't last very long, but it, it will last long enough for the beam to come back and sweep over that part. And if there is some residual charge left, the current through the beam will get attenuated and you can detect that with the appropriate amplifier. And therefore, this was a kind of refreshable memory. You could sweep the beam across the screen and detect the bits and reinforce them. And therefore, you could look at memory. You could see the bits on the screen. The picture on the screen is an, is an image of a computer memory with the bit set. This, in fact, was Alan Turing's output device. <laughs> when Alan Turing wanted to know the results of a program, he would look at the memory screen and see the bits themselves and write them down. The input device for uh, Alan Turing's computer, the ACE, was paper tape, which was as unreliable as it could be. Again, you know, trucks going by would damage the, the reader of the paper tape. It was, it was a difficult problem to get this computer to actually execute a program for a minute or two. <laughs> and yet he managed. Alan Turing managed to write a fair bit of code for this machine. Now, what language do you suppose Alan Turing was using? <laughs> well, there weren't any languages at the time, so he was using raw binary. And, and by the way, he was bright enough not to actually use raw, raw binary. He used base 32. 
So he would group his bits into groups of five. <laughs> and then he had a nice little alphabet that he used to represent the 32 possible bit groupings. And he would uh, create his instructions. He would create his programs in base 32. And then he would get them punched onto paper tape properly. Uh, by the way, the paper tape was five channel paper tape. So it was five bits per, per row. So <laughs> that, that's one of the reasons he chose five. And he would punch the appropriate pa paper tape, and then he would load that into memory using a little loader program, and then he would execute his program. Now, what kind of programs was he writing? Well, generally, they were mathematical in nature. He had some interesting uh, mathematical issues to resolve. So uh, he, he needed to invent mathematical subroutines. Now, the whole idea of a subroutine was kind of a brand new concept, and the machine itself did not have a stack, no place to push a return address. And so Alan Turing had to write the code for a stack. He, he, he didn't call it push and pop the way we might. He called it uh, bury and unbury, but it was the same concept. He would take the return address and push it on the stack, and that way he could have a an algorithm that he could call and then return from. He also had to do a number of other things. He had to invent uh, floating point numbers. The machine, of course, was an integer processor, as all computers are. Uh, he had to invent the concept of floating point numbers. Now, I want you to imagine the difficulty in writing a floating point math package in raw binary, base 32, <laughs> right? If you've ever written a floating point math package, you know that this is difficult. Even in assembly language, even in C, even in Java, it would be difficult. And by the way, I suggest you do this at some point in your in the next few days, take a weekend, you know, tell the kids to go away. This is going to be a deep, geeky dive into some really interesting stuff. And then write yourself a floating point mathematics package that just does add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And you will find it to be a very interesting experience. This is not a trivial thing to do. Well, he had to do it in raw binary. So he wrote a, actually a fair bit of code. He wrote a lot of code to investigate interesting mathematical problems. And then he gave a talk. About a year later, he gave a talk. And the talk was written down. And I'm going to give you some quotes from this talk that Alan Turing gave. Uh, one of the quotes is, there it is. We shall need a great number of mathematicians of ability because there will probably be a good deal of work of this kind to be done. <laughs> now, do you consider yourself to be a mathematician of ability? <laughs> Is that what you are? That's what he thought you would be. He thought all programmers would be mathematicians of ability. Why? Why mathematicians of ability? Because this is detail work, and you have to be very careful about it. In fact, he went on to say, one of our difficulties will be the maintenance of an appropriate discipline so that we do not lose track of what we are doing. And that, of course, should make you nod. Right? In 1945, in 1945, Alan Turing, after writing a little bit of code for this automated computer engine came to the conclusion that we were going to need an awful lot of programmers and those programmers better be damn disciplined. <laughs> you got to wonder, you know, how he knew. Well, he knew because he'd actually done the work. And now we look back on that and think, well, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we, we wound up with. We've got a lot of programmers in the world right now. Do you have any idea how many programmers are in the world right now? <laughs> I think it's probably on the order of 100 million, right? It's a lot of programmers. And, and do you believe that they're all mathematicians of ability? You think they maintain the appropriate discipline so that they don't lose track of what they're doing? Have you ever lost track of what you were doing when you were writing code? I have. I think everybody has. So this was the great insight that Alan Turing had in 1945, right? Programmers were going to be needed in great number. They had to have appropriate discipline and they needed to be mathematicians of ability. <laughs> now, we begin our historical tour. 
And the historical tour begins with the number of computers in the world, which I show here as being on the order of one. Big O notation of one. And there were actually a couple of machines built by 1945 or 1946. But OK, we'll just use big O notation on the order of one. And the number of programmers in the world was also on the order of one. I mean, there was a moment in time when there was one programmer in the world. <laughs> now there's 100 million. But there was a time when there was just one. There was a time when there were none. And then there was one. And then there was more than one. And that the time when there was one was roughly 1945. Now, consider that that is within a person's lifespan. There are people alive today that were born before there were any computers at all, before there were any programmers at all. <laughs> but now we need to move forward. Within five or so years, core memory had been invented. The idea was pretty straightforward, right? You're going to take a bunch of little metal rings and you're going to run wires through those metal rings and you're going to run current through those wires to magnetize those metal rings. And of course, you can magnetize them either north-south or south-north. So you can flip the direction of the magnetic field based on the direction of the current through the wires. And by doing so, you can create a memory device. Lots and lots of core memories were built between the late 40s and well into the 80s, by the way. Core memory was the way that we put memory into computers well into the 80s. And uh, by the way, the picture that you're looking at here is a picture of, of, of a core plane that I happen to own. It's up on my shelf up there. And I took that particular uh, micrograph, the zoomed in picture. I've got a little microscope that I use to, to take that. The little rings are rings made out of powdered iron and ceramic that have been fired together. So the iron particles will, will develop a magnetic field. And there are clever strategies for reading that magnetic field. You can cycle the data on and off a core plane like that um, at least a million times a second. So you, you can move those magnetic fields very, very fast. These kinds of memory devices were horribly expensive. And they were expensive because they had to be made by hand. Oh, they had looms, but the looms had to be manually operated. Uh, and so there were people, you know, threading the wires <laughs> through these cores. And of course, it had to be perfect, right? So a very expensive, e easily more than a dollar a bit, even in 1960 dollars. So very, very expensive kinds of things. I remember seeing my first megabyte. It was core. <laughs> it was a great big machine, roughly the size of a restaurant refrigerator. And it, it rented. You didn't buy one of these things. They were way too expensive. They rented for tens of thousands of dollars a month. <laughs> yeah, I was in the, I was in the, even in the late sixties, that was. So yeah, there was plenty of core memory being made and the vacuum tubes were getting better. Right, the, they were starting to get mass produced. They were starting to get reliable, and the the idea that you could build not just one computer but many computers was starting to become an idea. And so uh, we started to get these very early computers that weren't quite mass produced, but they were produced in some small quantity. And they would go out to uh, laboratories and, you know, big companies that could afford these machines that cost multiple millions of dollars and were, a, were much less powerful than my watch. But, but that was the way things were in those days. This is the era where languages were invented. You can imagine, right, writing in binary is not very satisfying. It, even though Alan Turing did it for well over a year, at some point, somebody had to go, gee, wouldn't it be nice to write something symbolic instead of base 32 all the time? Wouldn't it be nice if we had a language processor that could do some of the address arithmetic for us? And so languages were born. 
The Fortran specification was submitted in 1952, 1953, pardon me. And by the way, that's the year after I was born. I am older than Fortran. <laughs> what you're looking at on the screen here is a little bit of Fortran code. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever seen Fortran before, but it was an immensely primitive language. Look down there and you see there's line 703. See line 703 there? That's a, a typical kind of if statement from an early Fortran compiler. And it says if the variable IA plus the variable IB minus the variable IC is negative, then go to line 777. If it's zero, go to line 777. If it's positive, go to line 704. All the if statements in those days were just jumps, three-way jumps. It's called an arithmetic if statement. That's just kind of a simple overview of the kind of primitive languages that we thought during the day were really powerful. Fortran, that was the language. Of course, we uh, we input these kind of languages on punch cards. The Hollerf card had been invented decades before. It was the obvious choice. And so we, we would learn to punch our programs on cards. Although we, the programmers, did not punch them on cards. We, the programmers, wrote the code on uh, pieces of paper using a piece of, using a pencil. Programmers did not know how to type in the early days. They did not know how to use the keyboard. They would write their code on pieces of paper and then they would send those pieces of paper down the hall to the clerks who would then punch the, the, the paper onto cards. And then the programmers would take the cards a day or two later and they would thumb through the cards, reading the contents on the cards. And then they would eventually, if they got the the cards just right. They would walk them down the hall to the computer room where the computer operators would take the card deck into the computer room. And sometime around three in the morning, the operators would run the compile for you. You could come back the next day and get your listing and found that you forgot a comma. That was the way that we did coding in the 1960s and the 1970s even the early 1970s. It was a lot of punch card work back then during those days. This is the era of Lisp. Lisp was invented in 1958. <laughs> the first functional programming language was invented in 1958, right? Lisp went on. Uh, it's, it's one of the oldest languages out there, and it is one of the most survivable languages. We've, we've tried to kill it. Over and over, we've tried to kill Lisp, but it keeps coming back in different forms. It's, it is a, a very robust, very survivable language. <laughs> Between 1954 and 1960, IBM sold about 140 of these 705, 709 style computers. They were vacuum tube machines. They were input with cards. Uh, they might have had tape drives in the later years. They were multi-million dollar machines, core memory, vacuum tubes, very, very expensive. They could only be afforded by government laboratories or very, very high-end companies. And, and then, you know, what would those companies do with them? You'd program in Fortran maybe and write a little payroll application or something. There weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of programs out there. There was no internet. There was no user groups. There were no libraries of code that you could download. There were no frameworks. There were no operating systems. This was really, really bare bones stuff. And yet they sold 140 of these machines. One thing to note is that the picture here shows something that today is uncommon, but then was common. There's a woman sitting there at that console. Today, that's relatively uncommon. In the United States, maybe 3 or 4% of the programmers are women. But at this point in time, well over half of the programmers were women. In fact, here is a picture. I don't know if you can see it. This is a picture of Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper was... Um, uh, in the Navy, in the United States Navy. And she got interested in computers back then during World War II and then went on to become what we would now consider to be the CTO of Sperry Rand and UNIVAC. Uh, she is the first person to invent a compiler. She coined the term compiler. 
she went on to invent or co-invent the language COBOL, uh, which, well, for one reason or another, I probably will say very little about. But, but I mean, that was a very significant event at the time. Here, this picture is a picture of all the programmers on the ENIAC computer uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, a, 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 uh, uh, a computer that was concurrent with the, the automated computing engine of Alan Turing. That, and these, these people were programming by using patch panels. They were plugging wires in. They weren't using code. They were programming it with wires. This is, this is not anything to sneeze at. If we get to 1960, the number of computers in the world is on the order of 100. It might have been 200, might have been 500, but it's on the order of two orders of magnitude, right? That's about how many computers are in the world. The number of programmers in the world is roughly 10 times that. And why? Because computers were so expensive at that time that they had to be kept running 24 hours a day. You couldn't, take, you couldn't turn the machine off because you'd be losing money by turning the machine off. And so you needed enough programmers to keep the machine running. Moreover, there were no operating systems, there were no frameworks, there was no off the shelf software. So every bit of code that executed in the machine was written by your programmers. And therefore you needed a lot of programmers to keep that machine running. This 10 to one ratio, I think continued for several decades, but started in the 60s. Who were these programmers? Well, they didn't come out of school. <laughs> there weren't any, there weren't any uh, uh, university programs for uh, teaching people computer science. You couldn't get, uh, you know, uh, a, a course in Fortran or a course in COBOL or, or a course in computer science. There was no computer science. The programmers in the early days were employees uh, that were already there. They were scientists, they were mathematicians, they were engineers, they were already there. They were old, they were in their 30s or 40s or 50s. They were trusted and they were given the responsibility of figuring out how to make these machines work. Very interesting, not the kind of programmer you see today coming out of college. Coming out of college today, you've got 22 year olds. These people were older, more mature. They understood business. They understood projects. Different kind of programmer in those days. But things were about to get crazy. The transistor had been invented. And, and it was very obvious that the transistor was the replacement of the vacuum tube. It was much smaller. It was faster. It took almost no power. Vacuum tubes, every vacuum tube took at least one watt just to keep the filament going. The transistor didn't, didn't take any power at all to keep it going. It just took power to switch it and not very much power at that. So it was very obvious that this is the direction that the computers were going to go. Transistors were also cheap. You could mass produce them in, in lots of hundreds of thousands. Right. So, so the transistor took over and Almost immediately, there were computers based on transistors. By 1965, IBM had, had sold 10,000 1401 computers. Transistor-based computers had 4K of memory, although don't think of that K as being, you know, 1028. The machine was a decimal machine. <laughs> IBM had decided that if it's going to be a business computer, it's going to have to do decimal. So they actually made the machine a decimal machine. So when I say it had 4K of core, I mean, it had 4,000 words of core, 4,000. Even the memory was addressed in decimal. Fascinating machines, but they were cheap. You could, you could rent one for $2,500 a month, which maybe sounds like a lot of money, especially when you consider that that's $1,960. But still, that was within the range of a mid-sized company. Mid-sized companies could buy these machines or at least rent time on these machines. In fact, this is during the era when there were whole companies founded for the purpose of owning a computer that other companies would rent time on. <laughs> that was very common in these days. And these machines just proliferated everywhere. So now, five years later, 
the number of computers in the world is four orders of magnitude. There's tens of thousands of these machines around. Maybe there's 20, maybe there's 30. IBM was not the only company making these machines. How many programmers were there? Well, this 10 to 1 ratio still held. You still needed an awful lot of programmers to keep these machines running. And so there were probably 10,000 to 100,000 programmers in the world somewhere around. And again, none of them were coming out of college. These people were still already existing in the industry. This was the era of the aptitude test. <laughs> Lots of companies would, would design aptitude tests and have all of their employees who are interested fill out the aptitude test to see if you had the aptitude for being a programmer. <laughs> the tests were terrible. They didn't, they didn't do the predictions very well. But, but the, cusp, the companies were desperate to get programmers, and the universities weren't supplying them. So they had to pull those, those programmers from within their own companies. These programmers were employees. They were maybe marketing people or clerks or accountants, anybody with a little technical edge who, who wanted to deal with learning how to program a computer. This is the era where I kind of show up. You know, I'm 13 years old at this point. And already there's 100,000 programmers in the world, right? There's tens of thousands of computers. And I'm 13. I've gotten my very first computer. It's a plastic machine. It's got three bits, six AND gates. You, you cycled it with a little lever. It had springs and cranks and things like that. But I could program it. I could program it by, by uh, selecting the inputs of the AND gates and how they changed the flip-flops. I could make it count from zero up to seven. I could make it count down from seven back to zero. I could add two bits and produce a sum and a carry bit. You know, really, really important stuff. But at the age 12, it just fascinated the hell out of me. The programmers of the era were not CS grads, of course, but they were still drawn from inside the company. They were the best and the brightest of the accountants and the planners and so on. You can imagine the problem that industry had and although they weren't mathematicians, they were older. They were still in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and they were experienced, disciplined professionals. And I imagine that Alan Turing, after thinking about it a while, would have approved. Maybe they're not mathematicians of ability, but these are still the people who had enough discipline to focus on the job at hand. But things were going crazy. By 1966, IBM was producing 1,000 IBM 360s every month. Beautiful machines, wonderful machines. The IBM 360 was the workhorse computer of the 1960s and into the 1970s. Lovely machines. They had many different models of them. Some of them had 16K of core. Bytes had been invented. So now we're really talking about 16K bytes. And some of them had 64K bytes. Well, that was a big machine. 64. If you had an IBM 360, was 64K. You had a machine. And it was a very powerful machine. And these machines, look, look at the front panel here. They had lights. Lots and lots of lights and the lights would blink. You know, all those science fiction movies where the lights would blink. That was actually real. <laughs> the lights on these machines would blink like crazy. If you were a good programmer, you could look at the pattern of the lights on the computer and diagnose your problem. You could debug, oh, look at it spending too much time on that side, not enough time on this side. You could see what was going on inside the computer by staring at those lights. <laughs> this is the era. We're in the mid 60s here. It's 20 years since Alan Turing, 20, just two decades. And who have I got on the screen? I've got Ole Johandal and Christian Nygaard, who, playing around with Algol, <laughs> invented object-oriented programming. They invented a language called Simula, Simula 67. This language would go on to affect two people of note, Jarnus Strustrup, who was a Simula programmer and then had to program in C a little bit later and decided to make a preprocessor in front of C to make C look like Simula. That became C++. And the other guy of note who was a Simula programmer was Alan Kay, who went on to Xerox uh, and, and uh, invented the Smalltalk language. This was the 
core technology, the core insight of object-oriented programming in 1966, while these machines were still, you know, <laughs> IBM 360s and, and Univac 1108s and things like that. This is also the era where Dijkstra came along and said, you know, GoTo might not be such a good idea. Everybody was using GoTo for everything. That was the only way to branch. If you did a loop, it was a go-to. If you did an if statement, it was with go-tos. Everything was go-tos. And here along comes Dijkstra and says, you know, go-to. That might not be such a great idea. And he invented structured programming. Structured programming, which now dominates everything we do because our languages refuse to have go-tos in them nowadays. <laughs> this is the era where Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie begged time on a PDP-7 on, a, on an upper floor of AT&T and invented two critical technologies, Unix and C. <laughs> this was one hell of a time. And this, this era was the era where virtual memory was invented, operating systems were invented, device independence was invented. This was an extremely fertile time. Languages became quasi-modern. C was invented. You know, C was very primitive language, but we still consider it a kind of on the modern side of computer languages. Right? So fascinating time. Ma massive things were happening in the industry, including mini computers. Mini computers started coming out in the late 60s. By 1970, at digital equipment corporation that produced 50,000 PDP-8s, and they were just cranking them off the assembly lines. And there were a, a whole bunch of other companies doing the same thing. Mini computers were all the rage. There were companies you've never heard of that were making mini computers. Have you ever heard of Varian Radio? Yeah, I programmed on a Varian Radio 620F. There, there were lots and lots of these companies that were creating mini computers because of the success of Digital Equipment Corporation. I spent a lot of time programming PDP-8s. Wonderful machine, by the way. Had about a one microsecond cycle time, uh, but it took two cycles to execute an instruction. So you could execute maybe uh, half a million instructions per second. Typical machine shipped with 4K of 12-bit words. Lovely machine. Spent a lot of time writing code for a PDP-8 in the early days. And now the number of computers in the world has grown into the hundreds of thousands. We're, we're at 1970 by this point. This is, what, 25 years after Alan Turing. One quarter of a century <laughs> after Alan Turing, and there's a hundreds of thousands of computers in the world, and there are still 10 times as many programmers, although the ratio is beginning to shift. Not hasn't quite shifted yet, but the ratio is beginning to shift. There are operating systems now. There are some miniature frameworks out there. There's no vast library of off-the-shelf code, but at least you've gotten a little bit of leverage. And the machines are nowhere near as expensive anymore. You can actually turn them off without worrying about losing money. <laughs> I've taken you through 25 years at this point. There's probably a million programmers in the world. Who were they? <laughs> well, we kind of ran out of all the accountants and project managers and other people we could draw from. We really needed to get new programmers into the business. And luckily enough, the 1970s, the late 1960s and the 1970s is when the universities started to crank out computer science graduates. <laughs> and they poured out of university in hundreds of thousands. These young men, that's me, I'm one of them. I actually didn't come out of university. I taught myself, but I was still part of the horde of young men who poured out of that era, out of the universities, and joined the ranks of programmers. Tens and tens of thousands of new CS and EE grads pouring out. Industry was just gobbling them up. It had to have programmers. There were too many machines. There were not enough programmers. They had to hire these programmers. They hired them right out of school. And they all had something in common. They were all impossibly young, stupidly young, and they were almost all male. Don't know why. Don't know why. Don't know why they were all male. For some reason, 
It was young boys coming out of university. I saw this. I was one of those young boys. When I got my first job as a programmer, There were about 24 programmers in the company where I was working. Half of them were women. And the average age was in the 40s uh, of, all, of the men and the women, right? Because I was one of the new kids. And, and they literally called us kids. What are these kids coming in here? <laughs> these kids. I was like 18 or 19 years old. I already knew how to program Fortran and COBOL and PL1 and a bunch of other languages. And, and they really hired me to do assembly language anyway, which I could do easily. Um, just because I, you know, I was one of those, you know, weirdo high school kids that immersed himself in as much computer stuff as I could in the late sixties when you couldn't get your hands on a computer. My father would actually drive me to the digital equipment sales office and I would beg to please touch their PDP eights and I would write code on their PDP eights. So when I finally got a job as a programmer at the tender age of 18, there were like 24 programmers there. Half of them were women. There were a lot of women programmers even then. But 10 years later, in the in the 80s, uh, I worked at a place that had at least 50 programmers. Maybe there were three women. Maybe, right? And all the programmers were young by that time. They were all in their 20s. There weren't any old programmers left. The old programmers, the original programmers, right, aged out. By 1970, 1975, they had mostly aged out. They would retired because they started old and, and this young cohort just plowed into the industry, young 20 somethings, and they were the fresh new blood who didn't know anything. <laughs> the graph I've put up here is the graph of uh, women in uh, software. It, you see the three green lines. The three green lines are the number of women graduating from uh, STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Uh, and you can see that that continues to grow, although it kind of curves over at about 45% or so. But the red line there, that's computer science. That is the number of women graduating from computer science courses. And you can see that something weird happened in the early 80s, right? All of a sudden, that curve just turned around. Don't know why. I actually think it happened before that because I saw this happening in the industry in the mid 70s. You know, I started work at companies where there were a lot of women. Within five, six, seven years, those women were gone. And it was all it was all men, and it was all young men. So I think this graph is, I don't know, maybe they're drawing from a sample that was somewhere else in the country, but I saw this happen earlier than the 80s. But businesses had to have programmers. They had to have them. Didn't matter who they were, pretty much. As long as they came out of school with a CS degree, they were going to get hired. And what young men lack in discipline, you know, Alan Turing wanted them to be mathematicians of ability that maintained appropriate discipline. Well, these young boys coming out of CS school didn't have a lot of discipline, but they had a ton of energy. <laughs> they would work 80 hours a week. I did. My buddies did. We all worked stupid hours, hadn't learned our lesson. Don't work 80 hours a week, guys. Now, back in those days, 80 hours, sure, no problem, because I'm a dedicated guy. <laughs> and the other great thing about these programmers, these young kids coming out of school, they were dirt cheap. They didn't cost a lot of money. The, uh, the businesses could hire them for almost nothing. The, the salary I had when I first got my first programming job was $6,800 a year. Which, when you're 18, that's great. <laughs> I was still living at home. That meant my car payment. I could eat pizza anytime I wanted to. That was terrific. But you know, we came out of school. We were cheap. We had the energy. Businesses ate us up. Now, you got to remember, up to this point, the programmers who had been in the industry were disciplined professionals. They had been hired from inside the companies. They were older. They understood things. They didn't need a lot of management. You know, managers could just say, yeah, write, write this program and don't bother me because they would go off and do it, right? They didn't need a process. They just kind of figured out how to get the, the job done. They knew how to manage their time. They knew how to communicate and work together. They understood deadlines and commitments and what to leave in and who to leave out, you know, the old Bob Seger song. So. The, this was a time in the before the 1970s where programmers were mature. They were 
mathematicians of ability, more or less. They were disciplined after the 70s. That ended. That changed. And they were all young, young undisciplined men. <laughs> Those original programmers were the ones who had worked the miracles, right? They're the ones who invented virtual memory operating systems, device independence, Fortran, COBOL, PL1, Algol, C, all of that stuff was the Unix, all of that stuff, object orientation, all of that stuff was done by those original guys. They, they put men on the moon. <laughs> That's not what came out of school in the 70s. The original programmers knew how to get big things done because they were older and more mature. They were the mathematicians of ability, the disciplined folks that Alan Turing had dreamed about. What process might they have used? Well, we know what process they used. They didn't call it agile, but it looked a great deal like agile. They would work in short cycles. Uh, the Mercury space capsule engineers wrote their unit tests in the morning and made them pass in the afternoon. We know all that. We have the records from that. We, we know how those early programmers worked. And, and they worked in a way that if you observed it today, you would call it agile. <laughs> but that's not what happened. Because these hordes of young testosterone-driven men pouring into the industry had to be managed somehow. They needed a process. They needed something to keep them in line. And just in time, Winston Royce wrote the paper that described the waterfall model, and it was perfect. It was the perfect way to manage a, a bunch of unruly, undisciplined young boys in writing code. And that dominated us for 30 years. The waterfall process began, the waterfall era began with the induction of hundreds of thousands of young software developers pouring out of the universities, the, the escape of the older programmers, the retiring of the older programmers, so they were no longer around, and we wound up in the waterfall era for 30 years. And it took us 30 years to figure out you know, maybe we shouldn't work that way. <laughs> now, I want to do a little math with you. We've been through the time frame from 1945 all the way up to 2000. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I've skipped over, the crazy, the crazy Moore's Law growth of the hardware, the nutty things that happened to disk drives. Maybe we'll have a little bit of time to talk about that, but that's not the important. The important part is this curve I've got on the screen here. Think of how many programmers there were in 1945. Remember, it was one. Now, there's about 100 million, more or less. You can, you can do the guesswork here. It doesn't really matter. Maybe it's 200 million. Maybe it's 80 million. It's something like that. It's on that order. Let's say it's 100 million. How do you get from one to 100 million? in, what is it, 76 years, <laughs> 1945 to now, 76 years. How do you get from one to 100 million in 76 years? Do you think that was a linear growth curve? Clearly, it wasn't a linear growth curve. It had to be an exponential growth curve, right? It had to be some kind of doubling rate. Okay, well, what was the doubling rate? If, if we started at one in 1945, and now we've got 100 million, what kind of doubling rate would that take? Well, okay, what, what power of two is 100 million? Well, two to the 10th is about 1,000, so two to the 20th is about a million, and two to the seventh is about 100, so about 27. Two to the 27th is around 100 million, something like that, which means that there were 27 doublings of the programmers from 1945 until now. And what is that, 76 years? Okay, so 76 divided by 27 is 2.4. <laughs> the number of programmers in the world double every two and a half years. Actually, I think it doubled quite a bit faster than that in the first decade. In the, you know, the first day, there was one programmer, but the day later, there were five. And, and a week later, there were, there were 20. Right. So I, th I think the number of programmers doubled much faster in the first decade. And then it slowed down to the more sedate rate that we enjoy today, which is about once every five years. Once every five years, the number of programmers in the world doubles. 
And you've probably experienced this. You can probably look around and say, you know, five years ago, there were half as many programmers as there are now. <laughs> and, and the other thing about that is that half the programmers that you see around you right now are really young <laughs> because they just came out of school, right? We're hiring, we're doubling every five years, which means, of course, that half the programmers in the in the world have less than five years experience. Half the programmers in the world are these impossibly young kids coming out of, of university, and there aren't enough old people to train them because the doubling rate is too high. This leaves our, our industry in a state of perpetual inexperience. We cannot gain the experience in our industry because we are growing it too fast. Now, I don't know how much longer this doubling rate is going to continue, but but it doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. <laughs> not right now. And if it's 100 million programmers in the world, well, it's just not that many more doublings until everyone on the planet is a programmer. <laughs> and one of those doublings is going to have to be mostly women, by the way, because, you know, we've excluded about half the human race so far. So, you know, at some point, it's going to be an awful lot of women who are popping into the field. And I think we're beginning to see that now. <laughs> So what does the future hold for us? Where are we going in time? Well, <laughs> we're headed for a disaster. Why are we headed for a disaster? Well, I want you to look around. The room you're in right now, look around the room you're in right now. Count the number of computers that you can see in any device anywhere within your eyesight, right? Can you see a speaker on the, on the ceiling? There's probably a computer in there. Do you see a thermostat on the wall? Probably a computer in that. How many computers are on your body? Are you wearing a, a watch that has a computer in it? Do you have your phone with you? How about your car keys? Do your car keys have a computer in, on them? Do you uh, have iPad, you know, iPods, these little ear pod things, these Apple ear things? Or, or maybe you've got some other Bluetooth headset that you're using. Well, there's a computer in that, isn't there? Go upstairs to the kitchen. Right? Go into your kitchen. Look around. Microwave oven. Got a computer in it. How about the refrigerator? How about the oven? How about the washer and the dryer? Huh? Or how about your car? Do you have a car? <laughs> how much code is running in that car right now? Would you be surprised to find that a modern car has 100 million lines of code in it? <laughs> and that, that ought to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> now, most of that code, of course, is in the entertainment system and in the GPS system. But some of that code in the car sits between your feet and the engine. You push your foot on the accelerator, you'd like to think there's a mechanical linkage going to the engine. More often than not, nowadays, however, there are if statements in the way. And when you put your foot on the brake, there are if statements in the way. Wouldn't you like to know what those if statements say? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to read the tests? that the engineers used to make sure that those if statements were right. How many people have died because the software in their cars lost its mind? The software crashed and the car accelerated out of control and the brake system wouldn't work. Would you be surprised to find that that number is in the hundreds? <laughs> it's actually happened a lot. Right? And there's a lot more that have been injured. We are killing people. We programmers, we are killing people. We are now writing code in places that have the opportunity to kill people. Not only can we kill people, we can destroy whole fortunes. There are companies that have lost a half a billion dollars in 45 minutes because a software developer did something stupid. <laughs> you know, I forgot a comma. Ooh, it's a half a billion dollars. Our society depends on us more than it ever has. Our society runs on software. There is nothing that anyone can do in our society without software being in the middle of it. I mean, you can't cook dinner without software being in the middle of it. You can't call someone on the phone. You can't watch TV. You can't drive to the store. No law can be passed. No insurance can be filed or claimed or written. No law can be created or enforced without software being smack in the middle of it. Half of us can't even sleep without software monitoring our, our sleep and waking us up in the morning. Software runs everything. And you and I write that software. <laughs> you and I rule the world. Other people think they rule the world. 
Then they give us the rules, and we are the ones who write the rules in the machines that monitor and govern everything. <laughs> and that's why the catastrophe is coming, because sometime in the near future, some software guy is going to do some dumb thing and kill 10,000 people at a shot. And you know it's going to happen. It doesn't take that much imagination now to think of what that might be. Right? Think of the 737 Max. That was a lot of people. Well, let's multiply that by a couple of orders of magnitude and see how the world reacts then. Because when <laughs> that poor software schmuck, whoever he is, does the dumb thing and kills 10,000 people, the the <laughs> governments of the world will rise up in righteous indignation and they will point their fingers right at us and they will ask us, how the hell could you have let this happen? And we'd better have an answer for him, too. Because if our answer is, well, you know, my boss told me it had to be done on Tuesday. If that's our answer, <laughs> then the politicians of the world will do the only thing they can do. They will legislate. They will tell us by law what languages we have to use, what processes we have to follow, what books we have to read, what courses we have to take, what signatures we have to get. And we will all wind up being civil servants. This is something I would like to avoid, but how do we avoid it? We avoid it by recognizing in the end that Alan Turing was right. Software developers, programmers are mathematicians of ability with discipline. We, you and I need to learn the disciplines, the standards, the morals, the ethics. This is the future of programming. The future of programming is an exploration of who we are morally, who we are ethically. What standards do we follow? What disciplines do we use? Do you do test-driven development? Do you do refactoring? Do you follow clean architecture? Do you have these disciplines? Or do you just write code? <laughs> this is where I think programming is going. I think we've tapped out the technology. The technologies themselves are not going to massively improve. The hardware certainly isn't going to massively improve. I don't believe the software will. What is going to be improving over the next decade is us, our discipline, our profession. We're going to turn it into a profession. Right now, it isn't one because there's nothing we profess. But at some point, we will profess the standards, the ethics, and the disciplines that make us a profession. We aren't doing it yet, but I think that's the next step, the next thing to come. And with that, I believe I have exhausted my time. If you have some questions, please type them into the Q&A widget. And I believe there are people who will sort those questions and ask me to answer them. <laughs> and I turn it over to those able folks who will hand the questions to me. Thank you very much, Bob, for the talk and the, all the nice overview and your thoughts. <laughs> very, very interesting. We, we've got some questions. Okay. I'll start with the first one from uh, Radu. What do you think a capable programmer would look like in 10 years or more? So this is probably already answered right now from before but what do you think a capable programmer would look like in 10 years or more what capabilities would one have that differ from today's programmers would they even be programmers by today's standards kind of like turing thought programmers would be mathematicians but a bit ability abilities would they have I, I don't see a big difference between programmers now and programmers 10 years from now. I think they'll be the same kind of people. Uh, if we're still growing at a rate of you know doubling every five years, then they'll still be primarily very young and probably very undisciplined. What I'm hoping is that, that the folks who are programmers today develop the disciplines and the standards and the ethics that they can communicate to the younger folks coming in so that the younger folks coming in start with a basis of disciplines and standards and ethics. I don't think there's any real new technology coming. You know, we've we've kind of tapped out Moore's law. The machines are not getting faster. They're not getting much denser. 
There's a couple of technologies that are still improving, but they're no, not improving anywhere near the rate they used to. Software itself has really kind of plateaued. I don't think we're going to see any new software technology coming out. There will always be new languages, but they won't be new in any sense. They will just be rehashes of old ideas. We're already seeing that with the new languages that the new languages that are coming out now just chopped up old languages that have been reshuffled slightly. So I don't think we're going to see uh, any any massive increase in technology the way I did. Yeah. I lived through this period of Moore's law where the the power of the hardware multiplied by 25 orders of magnitude. <laughs> I don't think that's happening anymore. We now live on the plateau, the technology plateau. And we're going to have to develop the profession to deal with that technology plateau. So that, that's where I think programmers are going. There are two uh, almost similar questions, maybe also in this space. Uh, what role do you think AI machine learning will play? So one, because maybe this might replace our discipline. And the other thing, the other question is from Justin, do you think computers replace, can replace the humans in some years or, or even decades? No, computers will not replace programmers um, at all. The, the, the most we can hope for is um, better IntelliSense, I think. You know, tools that help us construct code. But there is no, no prospect I can see of AI becoming the programmers. I know people like to talk about this. Right? Well, pretty soon we won't need programmers because, because the AI will do all the programming. No, <laughs> that's... That is not going to happen. Not, not even close, right? The modern computer, first of all, there's the technology issue. A modern computer is a mental midget compared to a human being. The complexity of the human brain is just so vastly greater than any computer ever built. It, the, one human brain is more complex than the entire internet and all the computers in it. So don't even think that way. Secondly, we would not trust an artificial intelligence. <laughs> we've, we've got this problem right now where we think that we're going to have self-driving cars on the road. Many of us think that, you know, Uber is going to turn into a completely automated system where you get your phone out and you, you call an Uber and a driverless car pulls into your driveway and you get into the back seat and you tell it to take you to the store and it takes you to the store and then you get out and it drives away. That's not happening. <laughs> no one would trust that. No one is going to have driverless cars running down their neighborhood streets where their two-year-olds might run out in front of the cars. And let's say that a driverless car killed a two-year-old. How do you take that to court? How do you deal with that? What are the justice implications? What are the ethics implications of that? First of all, the technology is not going to be there to do that. And second of all, we, uh, the society is not going to be there to do that. I, th I think it's fair to say that we will have trucks on the highways, trucks on the motorways, because that's a very controlled situation, but they're not getting get off the, at the entry exits. <laughs> they're going to pull over and then get a human driver in to drive them into town. So that's, that's the way I think of that. AI has been this thing that people have touted for decades. And, and every time they do, they, they make vast prediction. Oh, machine learning, AI, it's just going to take over. And then, of course, it fades away. That's I believe, is what's going to happen in this case as well. It's a wonderful technology. It's lots of very good ideas, but it always gets oversold. And, and then in the end, there's vast disappointment. And I, I think that will continue. Another interesting technology often mentioned is uh, quantum computing. This is the question from Oliver. How do you think quantum computing will affect our industry? Yeah, I'll be real excited about quantum computing when they can get you know more than a dozen qubits to stabilize for more than 100 milliseconds. Uh, it's a lovely, interesting technology. Uh, it's perfectly possible that certain problems will yield very well to quantum computing. But it is not a Turing complete system. Quantum computing is extremely special purpose. There are certain algorithms, particularly factoring algorithms, that you can run through a quantum computer. But a generalized payroll system, a bill of materials system, uh, Angry Birds, 
nah. Mm -mm. The, the quantum computing system would not be any faster at that. It's only certain things that you can get the, the superpositions of quantums to help you out with. So do not expect quantum computers to suddenly magnify the, the power of the general purpose computer. It'll only be very specific stuff. Okay, thank you. Then there's a little controversial question from Danilo. I'll take us next. I would agree to almost all of it, does he says, but does but but does, do you, Bob, still program for productive systems nowadays and be able to recognize the problems of TDD? Uh, do I program for productive systems nowadays? Yes, of course I do. Uh, no, there generally it's programming for the the companies that I am involved with. So uh, I run a uh, I don't run it anymore. Actually, my son runs it, but but I am deeply involved with a company called Clean Coders. I work on that website. I write code for that. I also do an awful lot of coding on my own, my own website, and so on. Uh, and I do my own coding for in instructional purposes and so on. So I, I spend a lot of time writing code. Um, not as much as I used to. You know, I used to program eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Now I'd say it's probably about um, 10 hours a week, something like that. But I still write a fair bit of code. And I, I feel like I am uh, well-versed in the technology enough and well-versed with what's going on in the industry to be able to comment and, you know, comment with a fair bit of experience. So that's where I am with that. And regarding the mentioned problems of TDD, maybe this is something we can discuss in person uh, afterwards in the... Yeah, I mean, what are the problems with TDD? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we need to have a conversation about this. <laughs> Let me say this about test-driven development. It's Test-driven development is a wonderful discipline. It is not perfect. There are, there are times when you cannot do it. There are certain places where test-driven development just plain doesn't work. There are not that many of them, but there are, there are enough. And usually in any kind of large system, you're going to bump into those areas. And it's very frustrating. So you have to know where to use it and why and when and when not to use it and so on. You cannot treat it as a religion. You can treat it as a discipline, but you cannot treat it as a religion. Thank you. Then I've got a long question from Radu again with uh, 13 votes. Interesting, you talk about project planning in this evolution as the industry's response to the inexperience of the programmers. <laughs> Do you think the current trends in Agile that major co corporations are adapting like SAFE are a, re are a regression? Or how do you think project planning will evolve? Less, more ceremonies, more tied to politics as governments really rely more and more on software to enforce laws? What could be important in new ways of project planning methodologies going forward? So the future of Agile, for example. Yes, the future of Agile. Um, so Agile has... How do I say this? There, there have been a number of uh, additions to Agile, and those additions are generally adjectives. So safe or less or modern or skilled, all these adjectives that have been put in front of Agile. And typically, uh, those adjectives are trying to sell the idea that, that you can use our addition to Agile in order to do large projects. But Agile was never about large projects. Agile was a small idea about the small problem of small teams doing small things. Yeah. And by that, I mean teams of seven, eight, nine people doing 100,000 lines of code, something like that. That's what Agile's sweet spot was. That's why we, we, we came up with Agile was to allow teams of that size to figure out how to, how to behave well. Everybody wants to then take that and blow it up and say, well, okay, but how do you do it with 10,000 programmers? Well, that's actually a solved problem. Human, the human race has been doing big projects 
for 10,000 years. I mean, they built the pyramids. We won World War II. We sent people to the moon. We know how to do big projects. Once you've got the basic unit, the team down, we know how to control teams. We know how to manage teams. The problem we didn't know was how to get a software team to work. And that's what Agile solved. So I don't look at Agile as having a future in the sense of it progressing and getting better and better. I think of Agile as being an idea of, of how you get a small team to work. And then we use the normal means of getting multiple teams to work together. <clears throat> Operations research stuff that we've known for decades, for thousands of years, you know, how you get small teams coordinated. Interesting, thank you. Next question from Bjorn about the, the working hours per week. He <laughs> says, most programmers here in Switzerland work 42 hour work weeks with some companies offering 40 hour work weeks. <laughs> what are you, your thoughts on the argument that the programmer, however disciplined, can only be productive for N hours a day and thus we should shorten the work week. <laughs> um, so my, my view on that is that programmers, um, the ability to focus on code is a perishable commodity. You lose it. Uh, and and there's only so many hours you can do this per day, and 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 once you exhaust this, th think of it as a a vessel that is full of a certain amount of fluid, and every every time you write a line of code, this goes down and down and down until you've emptied that jar of of fluid, and it's only a certain number of hours per day that you've got in this jar, and the only thing that fills that jar is sleep and family and playtime. <laughs> That's it. Oh, and reading, reading of things. Any anything that you're doing to fill that jar up. I I like to read science fiction. If I read science fiction, my my jar fills up really well. If I spend time playing with my family, my jar fills up. And and if I sleep, God help you, sleep. Get a good seven or eight hours of sleep, and your jar fills up. And then the next day, you can kind of play it down. Everybody's jar is slightly different. Mine has, nowadays at my age, mine has about four good hours in it. <laughs> After that, my brain doesn't function. I'm gone. Forget it. <laughs> so, so nowadays, you know, I can do four hours. And then after that, I'm reading, I'm doing something else. I'm riding my bike. I'm flying the airplane. I'm doing something else. I'm not writing any code anymore. And then I have to fill up my jar. Everybody is different. I don't think you can Sorry, guys, there uh, seems to be a problem with a connection to Bob. Let's wait a couple of seconds if the connection stabilizes again. Um, Bob, we can hardly hear you. The image is frozen. Ah, cool. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. Because that's where we send the card. Uh -huh. Now it's you're unfrozen again. You back. <laughs> oh, am I? Yeah, you were frozen. <laughs> so we the, the internet was, was never designed for this. The, you know, the guys who designed the internet in the 1960s. <laughs> never anticipated that we were going to have streaming video and audio. So so uh, we, we probably need a different mechanism for this. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know where I was when I froze. <laughs> um, about in the middle of the explanation about uh, filling up the jar and how it is different for everyone. So you yeah, said okay. about 
four hours uh, for yeah. you now. For, this, for a young guy, uh, eight hours or six hours. Oh, have, maybe. Uh, number. Maybe. You know, and I think I think men and men and women are different in that regard too. They probably have different size jars. Yeah. <laughs> but but okay, you are responsible for governing your own use of that jar, and uh, be very very careful. Don't push it past the limit. That's the mistake that a lot of young programmers make. They will continue to code once they know they should stop. And all that's going to happen then is you're going to come back the next day and have to undo the mess you made. Uh, and it'll cost you much more than the time you thought you were saving. So learn your limits and govern that very well. And, and you know, there's there's always something else you can do uh, to fill up the other whatever remains of the 42 hours. Read a book. <laughs> Thank you. Another question regarding technology, and I think you will like it. What do you think... Uh, of the no code movement we have another no code movement right now i think i don't know what a no code movement is <laughs> how do you how do you generate software without writing code yeah okay so you can pull code from this place and that place and kind of glue it together yeah not not a real big fan actually i i am much more of a fan of uh writing things myself I'm skeptical of frameworks. I will use them, but I'm skeptical of them. I look at every every piece of off-the-shelf software I look at with a skeptical eye. Uh, my question is, you know, how is this going to screw me? Uh, and of course, they all have ways to screw you. So I'm always very careful with that. And if the problem is simple enough, I just write it myself. You know, for example, a web server. Web server is like 200 lines of code, as long as you're not going to do anything fancy with it. You want to put up a web page, it takes 200 lines of code. It's just not that hard. So there are many, many things that people use frameworks for. They probably ought not to. Thank you. Now uh, we're coming back to the discipline about becoming better programmers. And uh, I think Alan Turing would like this. So the, the question is how to get the discipline and become better programmers. I start with the question of Christian. Seeing the real world of programming today, we all can tell that there is a problem with standards and quality. E.g., for example, there are at least 80% or more of programmers who don't know anything about clean code at all. What are you proposing we can do so that people actually start using clean codes, clean architecture, and so on and so on? Now, Bob, you are frozen again. <laughs> Did you get the question? Well, were... my solution, you know, I, I do talk, talk like. I got the question. Okay, how are we? No, no, no. no. I can't. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think uh, we can give an answer, Alexander and, and me, for this. For example, let's meet each other and talk about these things. Now, Alexander, you are muted. I, I didn't see you unmute me. Uh, yeah, so, so the movement of the software craftsmanship, it was an answer for this. Uh, Uncle Bob, uh, bring this with uh, other folk. To, to bring the, the the software craftsmanship community to to bring and answer this uh, these problems, to to bring the discipline to practice, uh, we doing we doing event to um, yeah not only having Bob coming to us, but we have uh, activity like coding dojo uh, exchange exchange on the book uh, and trying and. We're trying to, to, to come to some company that wish to, to have us coming. 
to present how to be more disciplined. Uh, there is a community everywhere. There's one in Zurich. There's one in uh, in Chiasso, if I'm for, I'm not uh, correct. If I'm correct, or in Ticino, there's one Ticino, community. Yeah. So all the language, not the Romance one, uh, but all the language in Switzerland have a community, uh, a craftsmanship community to to help everyone. There are. Let's continue to talk, uh, Bob. Oh yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, now it's perfect, perfect again. <laughs> Oh, good. Glad it's perfect. Yeah, so my solution to that problem is to yell about it as loudly as I can at, at meetings like this. And yeah, I heard you talk about the communities that can form, and I think that's very important. We're going to want to have craftsmanship communities and professionalism communities forming and meeting and discussing the problem and, and gradually pushing this idea of standards and ethics and disciplines into our industry. This is what happened with doctors. It's what happened with lawyers. It's what happened with architects. It, it took decades and it'll probably take a few decades for us as well. And hopefully we can do it before government forces us to. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just checking the questions. The one from Ivan is related to this. Also from Alina. Uh, Gregor has a uh, question about, do you see open source development and massive peer review as a solution? Has it been in the past solution? Well, it's not a solution to the, um, the discipline and ethics and standards problem. But open source does have its place. It's very nice to work on an open source project. It's very nice to have other people reviewing your code, even at a long distance. So I think that will always have a place in our industry. But it's not the it's not the key to professionalism. And that's going to have to come internally. We're going to have to figure out what these these ethics and standards and and disciplines are. And I think that's going to take the formation of communities. Um, I'll pick the one question from Alina. It's also related to how to establish clean code, clean architecture. Maybe you can give her a hint about sh she can pitch it at her team and convince the people to start uh, learning about the stuff and uh, seeing the long-term benefits of it. Convincing people is always very hard uh, and you will not ever uh, succeed 100%. There will always be people that you fail to convince. Um, you can you can try, you can talk to them, you can present things to them, you can, you can do lunch and learns, you can do demonstrations, you can do code reviews. There's many, many things that you can do to help. But in the end, you're going to wind up with some people convinced and some people not. And this is a problem because now you've got people on your team with different sets of values and that's very unstable and they, they won't be able to coexist. So either the one side will have to go or the other side will have to go. You kind of hope that you can do that gently by you know, making them go to a different project inside the same company. Sometimes what happens is that the, the people who want to do a discipline can't do the discipline because the other folks in the team won't. So they will leave and they will join another team that does. And what we see across the industry is this general migration of programmers towards the values that they, that they desire. So over time, we're going to see programmers themselves moving and picking companies and picking teams that, that correspond to their own value structure. And that'll set up a very interesting competition that I'm pretty confident I know who's going to win. Fascinating thought. Another interesting aspect is about the role of the universities. A question from Ayason. Do you think the universities will change and adapt their course program? How do you imagine education will look like in the future? Unfortunately, we are in an era of not learning in depth, where TikTok and short YouTube videos are king. So the universities um, are always behind. 
uh, in in software because the real the real knowledge is gained on the job the real knowledge is gained in industry and very few of the professors teaching computer science have experience in industry so they're always behind they're always way back and they're never teaching what the programmers actually need to know the most common experience of a programmer coming out of school and going into industry is jesus i didn't know it was going to be like this so that has to change and and one of the things that i think will help change that is to change our concept of what programming is programming is not necessarily something you need to learn at university it's more of a trade it's something that you could learn at a trade school. It's something that you could learn over a, a two-year concentrated kind of apprenticeship program rather than a university program. So that's where I think that's going to have to go. And we're seeing that in the industry now where all of these um, um, programming schools have popped up, these boot camps, programming boot camps or 13-week programs to get to be a programmer. Uh, I think that's probably going to be much more common than the university track. Okay, thank you. So we are about half an hour in, into the questions section. Do you are still fresh to answer a couple of them? We still have some interesting ones. Or I have about 15 minutes before I must go okay. to a doctor's appointment. So <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions you've got. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we will use the time here in the big marker session with you. So we all can hear your uh, thoughts about these uh, aspects. The next question is uh, from Nelson. If programmers must address moral dilemmas, must they also address political questions? I don't know how you avoid that. <laughs> Because political questions and moral dilemmas are, are intertwined, right? So we're going to have to address that somehow or another. Now, does that mean that, you know, if, if you belong to one political party, you can't work for a company that, that uh, supports another political party? Well, it depends on the product they're producing. Like if you're doing Angry Birds, I don't think it matters, right? On the other hand, if you're, you know, going to work for a weapons factory, that might matter to you. Okay, I'm scanning the questions. We already covered some of the questions. Um, this is from Hans Peter, explicit about the evolution of programming languages. You mentioned there will nothing happen, or not, not very much happen. Okay. Yeah, I believe we've seen, um, I think we've seen every language that can be written. Um, and you could take the existing languages and kind of chop them up and reshuffle them, but that, that there'd be nothing new in any of that. I don't think we've seen anything new in a computer language since maybe 1970 or 80. Right? You, you could look at all of the new features that you see out there, like channels in the in Elixir or or uh, Go, or or you look at uh, object orientation, or you look at the traits in in uh, Kotlin or or something like that. And all of that stuff is old. It's all it's all been there before. There, there aren't any new. There haven't been any really interesting new ideas in a software language for a good long time. And so what we're experiencing now is this, this very strange, I call it a momentum. We were, we were tearing up the Moore's Law curve, right? We were roaring up this curve, this exponential curve, and everything was changing every year. And we got used to that. And, and our minds and our, our emotions are still in tune to that kind of momentum. Everything's changing every year. It's getting better and better and better and better. And that stopped. It stopped in 2003. But we still think it's happening. So, oh, there's better frameworks. There's better languages. There's better this. There's better that. And no, there's not. <laughs> it hasn't gotten much better since about 2003 as far as the, the hardware technology. And actually, the software technology really hasn't improved much in the last 30 years or so. Agile was a nice uh, uh, improvement, but it wasn't really a technology improvement. 
Test-driven development was a good improvement, but not a technology so much as a discipline. So yeah, I think I think you know the maybe the last really good change was maybe the change from C to Java, virtual machine stuff. Maybe. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now about becoming a better program, this takes uh, time. And uh, Michael asked, do you think in these fast changing times, there is enough time to have to spend for quality <laughs> and robustness and for programmers to become a better versions of themselves, <laughs> programmers of ability? <laughs> he compares it with building a house 200 years ago and building a house today, it's, we used to take a lot of time and build a house for decades. Now we build a house for, for some couple of years or so. Is there enough time to improve yourself? Well, there better be. <laughs> Otherwise, you're probably in the wrong career. Um, this is a dilemma that all programmers face, right? We have a certain number of hours we need to work for our employer. And generally speaking, the employers do not take responsibility for improving your career. You have to take that responsibility on yourself. And that means that you have to reserve some time for homework. <laughs> I know, nobody likes to do homework, but there's gonna have to be some homework. You should, if you're a programmer and you're worried about your career, you should be investigating new languages, new frameworks, all these things that are still pouring out and, the, and you have to learn them, even though there's nothing really new in them. You have to still have to learn them. There's all this newish stuff coming out. You have to be aware of it. You have to stay ahead of it. Uh, you can't, you cannot relax and say, well, I'm a programmer now and my employer's, my employer is going to make sure I'm a programmer 20 years from now uh, because they're not. <laughs> your, your employer uh, is just going to get as much as they can out of you. And then if you don't have the skills they need in, in five years, they'll find something else for you to do. An uh, interesting que question from Michelle about uh, outsourcing and offshoring, nearshoring. Do you think that companies will move the software development in countries where the programmers are cheaper? Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Dumb thing. Um, so that certainly has happened, right? We've seen this outsourcing issue many, many times. Um, the United States did a lot of outsourcing to India and other company countries like that. And and as long as there are labor rates in other countries that are less, there will always be this tendency to try and and get software developers in a cheaper country. But it doesn't work very well, and that's that's what everyone has found, right? It's, once you outsource to another country, you lose so much control and the quality issues are so difficult to manage that you start to bring it all back in. So uh, it's not a stable approach. The other, the other problem, of course, is that those countries become very competitive and then the rates go up. And so in the end, everything kind of equalizes out. If I were running a company, I would try to avoid outsourcing if I could. Then a geek question or geeky question from Anita. What do you think of programmers having almost no knowledge about hardware and computer internals? <laughs> oh, that's a big problem, actually. Um, so a, a programmer ought to know the physics of the machines that they're working on. And, and one good way to do that is to become an assembly language programmer. If you have never written assembly code, you do not understand the magic, right? You think, you think there still is magic, right? Once you become an assembly language programmer, once you've written a few hundred lines of assembly language, all the magic goes away. And you, you understand what these machines actually are, how moronic they truly are, how primitive they actually are. And you gain a much better understanding for the technology that you are manipulating. So at very least, every programmer ought to ought to spend several hours learning an assembly language somewhere along the line. 
Okay, so I think we will take the, the last question and stop then. And it's a little bit a controversial question about uh, predicting the future. So Jörg uh, writes, uh, a, a wise old man saying something won't happen, something has reached its peak. Aren't these predictions usually wrong? <laughs> yeah, very good. That's a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, right? <laughs> Uh, or a paraphrase of Arthur C. Clarke. Yes, uh, those predictions are probably wrong. Uh, no doubt about it. But they are the best prediction I can make with the, with the knowledge I have and the background I have. Um, so, I mean, you have to make what bet you want to make. But I know where I'm putting my money right now. <laughs> I, I don't think AI is going to be uh, the big thing that people think it is. I don't, I don't think we're going to be seeing massive new... Uh, hardware technology or new software technology, I think we've kind of plateaued. You know, could I be surprised? Sure, I'd be glad to be surprised. Perfect. <laughs> so I think we are at, at the end of the official part with a lot of answers to all our questions. Thank you very, very much, Bob, for coming. And, My pleasure. Uh, telling your story and uh, giving all, all these facts and the context for us and we are closing here now the webinar and we will move forward then for those who want to the wonder.me session you will be automatically forwarded um, from your browser so alexander so last one thank you thank you bob bye everybody to, to see you again yeah um, see you soon in a conference or somewhere else if we have the chance and for the community. So here is gonna be, that will be the last one for before summer for the holiday. So we take off and then uh, in September, we come back with more events. The booking is already full for the full uh, season of auto and until winter, until Christmas. Uh, we will come uh, with the news, I think what August, we come with the news about the the new topic coming or yeah we'll have, we'll have more crafters events like we had yeah collaboration with uh, software crafts from we will continue in the second half of the year we will have very interesting yeah. guests and uh really happy that we have uh so interesting speakers yeah. yes and for the one that understand french uh so we have already the, the speakers, uh, plan of several speakers, very interesting speaker, French speaker that coming to this, uh, this afternoon. Um, so you're welcome to, uh, to join. Uh, you're gonna see uh, the plan and I think on your website of uh, software craftsmanship uh, Romani. Okay, thank you and see you maybe on Wonder Me. Okay, bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>